Hello, everyone, and thank you for attending today's webinar, Shifting from Prototyping to Production with 3D Printing, brought to you by Design World Magazine. We would like to thank our presenter and John Good for being here today. John has a 35-year background working with high-performance motion control systems related to factory automation, electronics assembly, semiconductor inspection, and with 2 and 3D printing. He has held executive positions in general management, sales, and marketing with companies including PBC Linear, Rockwell Automation, Allen Bradley, and Anorad. John is a graduate of Purdue University with a bachelor's degree in mechanical engineering. I'm John Good from 3D Platform. Uh, for those of you not familiar with us, uh, we're a relatively young company, but our parent actually has 30 years of factory floor experience with emphasis on classic uh, subtractive machining, a la machine tools, as well as other non-contact fabrication processes, including gantry-style systems that you would find on laser cutters, water jets, plasma, and the like. As a business, our focus has been on large format FFF. And so uh, in terms of responding to the needs of the marketplace, I actually want to go ahead and recognize Stratasys uh, Stratasys Direct, which is uh, considered to be uh, a service bureau offering printing services across a wide variety of uh, printing technologies. There was a survey that was conducted uh, last year that talks about what the customer base is asking for. And I think this is particularly relevant because it represents a broad demographic of respondents, approximately 700 people, a wide cross-section of industries, spanning uh, uh, the aerospace industry, but an awful lot focused on automotive, general manufacturing, uh, and the like, as well as various company sizes from small through multi-billion dollar Fortune 500, and job functions from engineering through uh, production floor support through design. So, um, you know, the long and the short of it, people are excited about embracing additive as a complementary process to what they already have in subtracted and other plant floor uh, processes. Uh, and they view it as supplemental. Uh, some of the barriers to broader uh, adoption, quite honestly, fall into the category of cost of equipment, speed of processing. Uh, then you start looking at some of the things that were described earlier, which are cost of materials, volume constraints, and the like. These are things that are holding people back. So uh, 3D platform and others need to respond to this if the promise of additive is to be achieved. So with that as a backdrop, uh, one of the things that uh, we're asked to kind of highlight is how we're responding to those customer drivers. And to, to make it tangible, I wanted to go ahead and map it against some of the things that uh, were demonstrated by 3DP at the recent IMTS show that was held here in Chicago. And, and I'll speak to these uh, in the order reflected uh, in this slide. The Fortis 450, uh, which is the category of machine that's reflected uh, leftmost in this particular slide. And I'm speaking to build volume. Uh, this is a professional production grade machine, certainly held up as uh, you know, kind of a litmus test in the marketplace for uh, what, what the demanding customers expect. Yet comparatively, the build platforms are small. Uh, the, the dimensions there are reflected in millimeters, uh, but uh, just to go ahead and give people an idea, the approximate build, side, build size in inches, you're looking at approximately 16 by 16 by 14 inches. And there's many, many parts that are of that size, but obviously, um, even, even shy of staying away from aircraft interiors and, uh, and wings, there are many, many parts that are much larger than that kind of a, a work area. And people have the same needs for design prototyping, form fit function validation and the like, uh, even in, uh, in uh, what I'll call non-aerospace applications. So one of the things that we've tried to do is go ahead and make large build platforms affordable. What's reflected in the second column there is an offering uh, that we titled the 3DP Workbench, which to go ahead and put it in perspective, offers a one meter by one meter by 500 millimeter work area. And if you look at relative uh, build volume, 
that's uh, as we shoot for orders of magnitude improvements, that class of uh, machine offers roughly a, an 8x uh, build volume uh, expansion. But uh, one of the things that we wanted to go ahead and show is that uh, we, we need to go beyond that. At the IMTS show, a couple of different additive manufacturing and what I will call multi-process platforms were shown. As an example, the third uh, icon to the, to the right is a delta format uh, robotic transform. That particular transform allows us to go ahead and make very uh, well called tall and perhaps thin objects cost effectively. Uh, getting to build volumes in a one meter by one meter format, it's 18 times. But this is, an ex as an example, a uh, format that can be extended up to four meters tall. And I'll give you a couple of examples of where that's relevant. Uh, in, the, uh, in the world of prosthetics, in the world of braces, uh, you know, with so many different scanning functions and the like, uh, people want to go ahead and have long and tall objects. And this particular uh, format is conducive to that. So a typical application would be, uh, as an example, in the world of architecture, people going to designing columns with very interesting fascia or uh, ornamentation. So imagine a, a column being built to scale uh, to serve as perhaps a, a mold master. Um, other examples, literally full body, uh, what I'll call scans converted to print. You know, that could be uh, something, whether it be in essence a statue or whether it be something a little more practical such as orthotics, prosthetics, uh, an example being torso braces for uh, children or adults with scoliosis and that type of thing. And then the final format that's uh, reflected in this particular slide is to go ahead and show the idea of going larger yet. Uh, what you see pictured there is a platform that we titled the 3DP Excel. Uh, in its smallest format, 1.2 meters by 1.2 meters by 2.4, uh, but extendable in cross section and uh, extendable in length. Think of it as uh, having the ability to go ahead and take train sections and continue to add on. So that, uh, that base build platform that would be 50X, the reference point, uh, can go well beyond that. So same driver, same paradigm that Scott was describing, addressing the need for larger build platforms. Let's go beyond. Uh, now people want to go ahead and have faster prints. And to, to, to put this in context, going left to right again, in our Gen 1 uh, FFF style printers, the class of extruders were limited in terms of their thermal capacity and therefore the ability to melt filament and then go ahead and dispense it uh, in the form of a layer on a print. Uh, to put this in perspective, throughput per hour, Gen 1 was literally 36 grams per hour. Uh, to go through a, a 2 kilogram roll of filament, you're starting to push you know, approaching 20 plus hours. And, and you know, that's, that's just too long. It, it harkens back to the old days of dot matrix uh, printing, where everything used to be described as pages per, per minute. Now everyone expects pages per second or a fraction of a second. So those same paradigms in the world of 2D uh, are, reflect what people are hoping for in the world of 3D and additive. So to show progress, uh, what's reflected in the middle is an example of a larger format extruder. Uh, this particular extruder, which we call an HPE, a high flow put, high flow extruder, uh, Instead of having small filament, now all of a sudden we're looking at filaments six millimeters in diameter with nozzle sizes uh, as high as 4.5 millimeters. So those of you who've been exposed to the Oak Ridge, uh, um, Oak Ridge National Laboratory, the BAM project, where literally you're putting down uh, uh, rope uh, diameter filament in order to achieve speed and strength, that type of thing is, is being brought forward uh, uh, with the kind of functionality that's described in this slide. So now all of a sudden you're starting to get into throughputs that can be measured in not grams per hour, but kilograms per hour. Uh, that particular extruder 
approximately uh, achieving two kilograms per hour type of throughput, which is about 50 times in, uh, increase. But uh, as we've seen from plant floor related processes, uh, the, the way you go ahead and achieve throughput is to leverage some, uh, what I will call adjacent space. And when you look at the world of real industrial extruders, real uh, industrial injection molding machines, by going to screw style extruders, we're able to achieve throughputs uh, in small pellet fed extruders at the uh, four to six kilogram per hour. And then as you go larger and larger, uh, literally going to 50, 60 kilograms per hour. So uh, look at the order of magnitude changes there in terms of volumetric throughput, plus other benefits by transitioning from filaments, which by their nature are monolithic, the ability to go ahead and allow people to uh, have creativity and flexibility with uh, pellet style uh, raw materials. Continuing on though, uh, people not only want to go bigger and, and faster, but the reality is additive, subtractive, robotic are core processes that each have their own strengths and limits. Uh, what we have seen from our customers to date is that people want to use the optimal tool for the task. Uh, it's kind of like uh, in your toolbox, there's a reason there's a screwdriver, a hammer, and a wrench. They're good at different things. So instead of compromising, a direction that we have taken is to allow people to go ahead and, in essence, run parallel multi-process. This has become very common in industry. Uh, semiconductor uh, flat panel uh, plasma displays where multiple, what I will call operating heads, interchangeable tools uh, are used in the same work area in order to address either speed through parallelism or to go ahead and address, uh, once again, optimal function for the task. So this category of machine gives the ability for additive, subtractive, robotic functions. And I'll give a couple of examples where that's relevant. When people look at mold making, whether it's sand molds, whether it's castings, or some of the other processes that are out there, vacuum form and the like, you can get into some extremely large objects. Think fascia, think car panels, think uh, the, the type of things that you might have on a backhoe, uh, very large objects. Historically, that has been addressed in terms of putting together the, the mold pattern by way of starting with a piece of either virgin plastic or a piece of um, some other material, aluminum and the like. And literally what could be a meter by a meter by two meters worth of uh, virgin material gets whittled down. Literally, it's not uncommon to see people who have 95% of the raw material end up on the floor in the form of shavings uh, and the like. What people are doing today, and you can imagine how expensive that is, how time consuming it is, we have people today who are printing using the FFF process like we're talking about, and they are printing near net shape. So imagine uh, something that looks like uh, a door fender, uh, relatively uh, thin cross section, and then what they do is for dimension critical functions, they then go in and with a classic uh, five axis CNC or perhaps an articulated robot, go in and do some secondary processes, whether that be to drill, tap, or some other uh, process critical or dimension critical task. Uh, the other thing that we have seen people do, uh, the FFF process lends itself to incorporating non-printed objects into the overall uh, project. So imagine adding in electronics, fasteners, hinges, uh, that type of uh, fare. Uh, instead of trying to go ahead and, in essence, print that, the ability to go ahead and take something that might be designed, uh, once again, use electronics, and insert a printed circuit board into a cavity and then continuing print. Uh, and, and this kind of capability really expands the application footprint for additive because it's working in concert with the other uh, processes. 
with all of these innovations, some of the most exciting things really relate to materials. And I'll just give you a couple of examples because we don't have time to cover them all. By going open market with materials, it harnesses the energy of material scientists globally. Uh, people with uh, literally thousands of uh, chemists, material scientists, uh, who, who know how to go ahead and, and blend various polymers to achieve an end goal. An example would be, we've talked about castings as being one of the preeminent applications. And uh, as an example, it's really important for those of you familiar with lost wax process and the like, when you're, when you're trying to make a mold master for a casting, to have any residue is a real problem. And what I'm showing here is a polymer that at 600 degrees centigrade burns away clean. So you can, in fact, get a, a high quality functional mold. That's just an example. A um, couple more examples. I believe everyone on this call is familiar with ABS. ABS is a phenomenal polymer. Uh, and the fact that it was patented back in 1948 by Borg Warner shows how long it's been relevant. However, a lot has transpired in the world of uh, material science and polymers. Uh, there are new plant-based polymers, uh, including PETG, which everyone's familiar with from their water bottles, et cetera, that are plant-based, therefore eco-friendly. Don't put off some of the, the smells that people find uh, to be an irritant uh, with what I would call classic petroleum-based polymers, yet without sacrificing material properties. What's being shown in this chart, and I know it's a little bit of a, an eye test, is when you go ahead and look at material properties, such as bending modulus, tensile strength, impact strength, uh, imagine contemporary uh, plant-based polymers actually having properties that go beyond EB ABS. Um, and, and a good example of that, for those of you who are familiar with PLA, polylactic acid, uh, it's an example of a corn-based polymer, but uh, the initial formulations of it, quite honestly, were hard and brittle. But once again, with the advent of an open market mindset and, and the contributions of uh, material scientists and uh, chemists, uh, there are now these plant-based polymers that have, have introduced material properties that, that quite honestly go beyond ABS. So it's great. It opens up possibilities. And then an area, uh, Scott mentioned Ultem. Ultem is a perfect example of a high temp polymer uh, suitable for some of the most demanding applications like uh, in engine compartment uh, where people are trying to uh, replace aluminum parts. Uh, Ultim is a, a terrific uh, material, but there are other polymers that are coming forward. Uh, a, a case point to this is glass-filled nylon or carbon fiber-filled nylons, where today in an FFF format, cost-effective open market, uh, we're able to achieve uh, temperatures uh, at that 150 degree C, which in many cases is suitable for, once again, the automotive parts or uh, in-engine compartments. Not all, uh, but certainly um, a percentage of those applications. Continuing on, uh, software, software integration was touched on by Scott, and I'd like to amplify it from a slightly different angle. Uh, a funny story, uh, I was at a very large trade event in Europe just last week, and anybody who walked IMTS knows uh, about day three, your feet feel like the picture on the left. They're, they're really, they're suffering. And uh, it's a, especially problematic when you have bun, bunions, corns, all those type of things. So everyone has been targeting to go ahead and have that uh, orthotic that is made just for John or just for Scott or just for you. Uh, a very unique example of open market and the innovations that come from it. We can all look at our, our cell phones and see all the apps that have unfolded for Apple, for uh, Google phones, for Android phones. This is an example of a company, Gensel, who has put up on the web a piece of software that allows you to literally scan your foot, import that as a 3D model, have attributes 
that allow you to go ahead and create variable density models in order to go ahead and create your insole. It exists today. It's on the web. It's open. And, and what it does is all of a sudden it, it, it opens up the floodgates for innovation uh, for people um, you know, who, who may have the misfortune of, of having uh, lost a limb or, quite honestly, uh, having some limits. Uh, these are the kind of things that by, by combining the, the energy of the marketplace together with additive, these are the doors that are opening up for us. I've included the name of the company. I recommend anyone go take a look at it. When you look at variable durometer, where imagine on an insole you want to go ahead and have soft spots, hard spots, and everything in between, uh, the, the kind of design tools that allow you to do that. And uh, to, 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 to do this uh, briefly, people need reliability. People want yield rates out of their production machinery that uh, are in line with what they have from world-class CNCs, metal cutting equipment, and the like. Uh, and so the expectation of, of having that type of uptime and overall equipment effectiveness is there. So technologies that are fine for the commercial marketplace, open-loop stepper, belts, uh, things that you might find in a commercial-grade copier, uh, that's fine, uh, but not when people are trying to go ahead and address production applications. So utilizing industry-proven uh, uh, mechanical, electrical software integration from the factory floor is absolutely uh, a, a, a trend and a strong foundation to build on. But come the end of the day, you've got to be able to afford it. And uh, the affordability falls into acquisition costs as well as operating costs. And our focus as a business has been to go ahead and address order of magnitude improvements. A case point to that would have been our original one meter by one meter by half meter platform, which has a, a purchase price under $30,000. But you know, when you go out and buy a vehicle, you still have to be able to go ahead and put gas into it. You still have to be able to go ahead and afford the, uh, the, the maintenance. And so operating costs are a huge driver and my graphic is intended to go ahead and show, as an example, if I were to go ahead and print just one of those, what I will call proof of concept gas tanks. Uh, let's say I'm uh, making my next gen uh, motorcycle, and I want to go ahead and get validation from the marketplace regarding my design concept. Uh, to, to go ahead and print that gas tank current state uh, in, in the open world market, that would be approximately $500 worth of material cost. In the closed market environment, quite honestly, it's a factor of 10 higher than that. So if you're only printing one gas tank a week, uh, 50 weeks a year, you can see you're talking about uh, approaching a quarter million dollar spend versus uh, a mid $20,000 spend. And I highlight this to go ahead and show this is an important driver uh, that in, in our opinion, is must be addressed in order for people to go ahead and broadly adopt these technologies, uh, and that's why it's such an area of emphasis. So I'm going to go ahead and wrap up with that. I'm uh, you know, pushing a little bit over my allotted time. Uh, there's some reference links for there, and Leslie, I'll turn it back to you. Great. Thank you, John, for an excellent presentation.